Good evening and welcome to the October 11, 2021 work session of Mayor and City Council. Tonight we have two items up for discussion. Uh, the first one is an update from Montgomery County Public Schools on the upcoming Crown High School uh, project, the design and the public outreach. And um, it, to introduce this, I'm going to hand it over to our Deputy City Manager, Dennis Enslinger. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. As the Mayor noted tonight, we have with us representatives from the Montgomery County Public Schools and Stantec Architecture, who will be providing a presentation on the future Crown High School site. Um, just to fill everybody in a little bit more detail about how the city acquired the site, it was through an annexation agreement with the developers of the Crown neighborhood. Uh, the city will ultimately transfer the site to Montgomery County Public Schools as we work through the process. The presentation tonight will primarily focus on two areas with some presentation of the conceptual designs and the process for community engagement on those conceptual designs. Seth Adams with the Montgomery County Public Schools and Dirk Jeffrey with Stantec will lead off the discussion tonight. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Seth and if the tech team could pull up page number three of the packet, uh, for the presentation, I'll go from there. Well, thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, to provide an update on the uh, the Crown High School project. Um, so so I, I did want to start and say, you know, we have quite a few slides, but we're going to be quick through them. So, you know, certainly, um, you know, please feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, but I would also say is that we, we are very early in our process. Um, you know, this this presentation is ahead of our community engagement process, which which is which is sometimes a little out of this is a little out of the sequence in terms of that that true feedback and engagement that we typically want to go through. Um, but we did want to really share some of the ideas and concepts that we start to to think through. Um, certainly, knowing that once we really have that deep engagement, that certainly many of the things that that we will show you tonight may change. Um, but, but again, it is, it is essentially, uh, you know, the, the goal of tonight is to walk through uh, the overall process, just to give everyone, you know, some general idea of, of the site constraints and, and some of the concepts that, that we can work with, really some of the opportunities for, for building a, a new state-of-the-art high school. Um, so I, I will just, you know, again, we have quite a few slides, but um, we're going to move very quickly through them. The first few slides are just introductory slides, and then and then we'll dive right in. So if we could move through the slides, please. Next slide. You know, so again, that's that's our going to be our agenda. We're we're obviously uh, the 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 meat of the conversation. We want to uh, jump over to the design concepts and engagement, but we'll certainly give uh, some some updates along the way. Next slide, please. So again, just you know, from our side, um, I know we've we've met many a times, uh, you know, talking through some some of the great projects that are happening in the city, uh, particularly uh, you know the new Gaithersburg Ele Elementary School over at Kelly Park. Um, so a lot of the same members from that team are are also participating in this project. So hopefully we have uh, some really good familiarity with our team and your team, and and we'll have some smooth. Uh, smooth operations as we go through this. So next slide, please. And over um, on the uh, the academic side of the MCPS house, we have with us uh, Scott Murphy. He's the director of the Department of College and Career Readiness. Uh, and, and certainly his feedback in terms of, of what types of program go into this building is going to be key. So if there's any questions that we have, if we, if we want to talk through some ideas that we have from a school district and where we're headed from some of our curriculum, uh, Scott is here to address some of those questions. And we also have Gen Genevieve Floyd, which is uh, a critical member of the team in looking for post-secondary partnerships. Uh, again, this is a, a, a school that's really prime location when we think about partnerships with businesses. We think about partnerships with uh, post-secondary uh, education. So, so Genevieve will be very integral to this project moving forward. Next slide. And uh, over on the Stantec team, um, Dirk Jeffrey is here to talk through, um, and he has a, a, a really talented team supporting him through this process. Next slide. And design consultants, again, you've, you've probably seen a few of these, uh, similar to you know, consultants that have been on other projects that are within the city. 
but uh, certainly the Clark Azar team, the civil engineer is one that uh, will be working very closely with your team over at city staff as we work through this. Next slide, please. And we've also brought on a uh, construction management team early on in the process to make sure we're, we're uh, working through um, value engineering opportunities, making sure we're staying within uh, budget constraints. Next slide. So really diving into the project history. So um, obviously you heard from, uh, from Mr. Enslinger about the overall timeline of this. So this certainly has, has uh, uh, you know, been part of an annexation agreement since 2006. And within that, there was a provision of a 20 year, uh, essentially a 20 year timeline with this property uh, for MCPS to take advantage of this and, and to build a school. So that 20 year timeline uh, is in 2026. And, you know, the, the timing of that is that, you know, MCPS and ultimately the uh, county council have to have uh, construction funds within our first two years of the CIP. Uh, so as it stands right now, we, we have received planning funds back in May of 2020 as part of our FY21 budget. Um, and we are looking to uh, obviously work through our CIP process this fall and this spring, but all signs are, are pointing to a superintendent request for uh, construction in the FY23, which would ultimately be next summer's uh, CIP. And, and all that is with a goal of opening this building uh, in 2026. Again, you know, the provision was that construction funds had to be in place, but as it stands right now, we are, the Board of Education is requesting a completion date of 2026. So we're, we're in pretty good shape in terms of the timeline on that, but certainly uh, something that we're gonna have to keep close eye on. And hopefully we can partner with all of you uh, in our conversations with the County uh, Executive and County Council on our funding of future CIPs. In terms of the overall property transfer, um, obviously that goes through a, a very um, detailed process, but you know, from, from our end, from the MCPS side, since we are a quasi-state uh, local agency, we have to work with the state on any types of acquisitions or, or intended acquisitions. So we have already, um, as, as late as December of 2020, worked with our Board of Education to have approval to, to essentially move the process forward and in the uh, spring of 2021, uh, we received approval from the state clearinghouse on this particular property. So, so really the only thing left is to have those funds in our CIP and, and to then start moving through that uh, property transfer acquisition process. In terms of uh, a boundary study, that happens much further along um, in process, typically a year, year and a half before a school opens. Um, but one that we will keep close eye on this this particular school, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about it in in the next few slides. But it will be impactful to at least five other clusters in the in the county, um, and and I'll I'll go over a few of those details on the next slide. But ultimately, this will be um, one of the largest boundary studies, um, boundary processes in MCPS history because of its impact on so many high school uh, clusters, which is a good thing. So it's, it's certainly an opportunity. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a, a few details, uh, again, this, this is a capacity project for us. Um, many of the, the surrounding schools are over capacity. So we are looking at the moment of building to 2,215 students. That's from a programmatic standpoint, um, but, but designing for a core of 2,700. And what I mean by core is, is really all those ancillary spaces, support spaces, everything from cafeteria to um, you know, media to gym, uh, those, those types of spaces so that the building can accommodate up to 2,700 should we add additional classrooms in the future. Um, right now, the, the, the building based on our program is, is uh, in that 325,000 square foot range. And, and one of the things that we have um, talked through are, are, will this building have um, different programmatic opportunities, whether it be signature programs, whether it be dual enrollment opportunities with, um, with again, with some of our higher ed uh, institutions. I, I, I would say the location is prime for obviously everything from biosciences to, to technology to see how we can partner with local businesses, um, but certainly well positioned for students to take advantage of 
everything from uh, universities at Shady Grove to Montgomery College and 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 beyond. So, so again, this is a this is a, a perfect location for us as a school district with with some of the initiatives that uh, that are currently happening. Next slide. Again, this is just a, a an overview of what we're looking at. This is essentially the ed spec with the architect is designing from, which is certainly subject to change as we as we get a little bit deeper into this. Next slide. And again, we, we wanted to show this. Um, obviously, you know, folks know where this property is, but the adjacency to uh, the other schools that are going to be impact, impacted. So, so again, we have Northwest High School, Gaithersburg High School, Quince Orchard High School, Wooten High School, Richard Montgomery High School, all really being a part of this process when we get closer to opening it. You know, you have schools, Gaithersburg High School, uh, projected to be 457 students over capacity. Quince Orchard High School, 600 students over. RM, another 600 students. So you can see that the growth at the, uh, the high school secondary levels has been pretty significant in this area. And again, why the timing of this project is, is extremely important to us as a school district to make sure we can uh, accommodate um, surrounding schools and community growth. So, so that's an that's a, a overview of the project from the MCPS perspective. And certainly, you know, we will dive in and, and talk a bit more. But at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jeffrey to, to start walking through some of that conceptual um, thought process uh, with this particular project. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Adams. Good evening, uh, Mayor Ashman, members of City Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. And on behalf of our entire team at Santec, thank you uh, for this opportunity to share with you some of the planning and the early progress has been made on the new Crown High School. This is just an aerial slide, aerial image of the Crown development uh, taken some time ago. It's not current, but I do think it does help to uh, illustrate the location of the high school site relative to its immediate surroundings and its proximity to roads, points of access, residential and mixed use areas and other land, land uses as well. And we'll look at all of that more closely in just a moment. Next, please. This is just a transition slide to move us into the next portion of the agenda and to share with you the three approaches to the planning of the building and the site that grew out of discussions with MCPS over the course of the summer. And I'd like to emphasize again what Mr. Adams said earlier, that all of this work that we'll present tonight is highly conceptual in nature. And so even though the illustration that you may see or uh, about to see suggest the design is further along than it is, that's definitely not the case. Instead, what these concepts represent are test fits of how the primary building blocks of a, pro of a high school project, the things that take up land area like the school itself, like parking lots, like play fields and so on, might lay themselves out on a relatively small site. Next, please. So looking first at the site for the new school, the site itself is bounded by Fields Road to the north and Omega Drive to the east. These are the, this is colored in blue on this image and the arrow is pointing into the site, indicate the location of the primary points of access from these roads. The main streets of the Crown development are shown in green to the left and terminate at the Western boundary of the high school site. The entire site is just over 30 acres, although five of those acres are designated as forest conservation easement and are basically off limits to development. So there's about 25 usable acres of land area remaining. Lastly, there's a fair amount of slope to this site. It's indicated by the elevation references that you see there. You'll notice the 491 at the entrance from Fields Road to the north of the site. There's about a 40 foot fall to the south to the 450 marker that you see just above the forest conservation easement. The site also slopes in the direction of the crown development to the west. As you notice from 480 to 470, it falls off the 464, 452 and 448 along Morrison Drive. Next please. The next few slides just offer a quick tour of the crown community if you haven't seen it and are familiar with it, beginning here with the mixed use building type of downtown crown. Next please. The townhomes that are typical of the Crown community. Next, please. These are mostly four level townhomes exhibiting a variety of architectural styles, well detailed, lots of scale giving elements like dormers and bay windows and water tables. 
features that create relief and interest in the elevation. Next, please. The development also includes a community building, which is larger in scale, but the massing is still very compatible with the surrounding architectural character. This slide also shows an image on the right of a public park that's part of the Crown community. Again, real attention is paid to material, scale, landscaping, all of which contributes to a very pedestrian friendly sense of place and experience at, Crown, at the Crown community. Next, please. The next few slides are images onto the site and we'll begin with the views to the site from the east end of the Crown community. This is Crown Park Avenue at the Eastern Terminus. And from here, you can begin to see a bit of the slope that I mentioned earlier and a bit of the forest conservation east area on the right side of each of these images. Next, please. These are images looking up and down Morrison Drive, again, which is the street that separates the school site from the adjacent residential area. Next, please. These are just views along Fields Road. This is the four lane divided area just where the signal occurs at Washingtonian Boulevard. The image on the right is looking mostly west back toward the downtown crown. Next, please. And then this is images of Omega Drive as it passes our site to the east. So all these slides are simply meant to just provide a sense of the scale and the character and the use of the buildings and streets that make up the immediate surrounding community. Next, please. I mentioned a moment ago that we developed three initial options based on several meetings with MCPS over the course of the summer. And these are all intended to reflect different ways of using the site that might include different placements of the building, parking and other site amenities that all would address established points of access onto the site and respond differently to the adjacent community. Again, these are all very preliminary, idea, preliminary ideas and not nearly as much detail as it might seem, but probably good enough to serve as a starting point to foster good discussion with the community. And so we'd like to review that work with you now. Next, please. So this is what we're referring to as option one, and this is the site plan. North is up. The white object in the middle is the building plan. The light gray areas are uh, indicate areas of asphalt for buses and cars. The tan area denotes pedestrian space. The darker green are the athletic fields as opposed to the light green lawn areas. And then finally, the red are the athletic surfacing of uh, track and tennis courts. This option intentionally creates a low impact green buffer edge next to the community made up of tennis courts, softball and baseball fields. Parking for buses and cars and services are as remote as possible to the east side of the site. And so the L-shaped form of the building creates a screen, but also creates a sense of enclosure for the main visitor and, and car arrival off the Fields Road. The stadium is at the lowest point of the site, and there are two public plazas, one on the entry side of the building and another on the stadium side, connected by an opening through the building, which we'll see in just a moment. You'll also notice the stadium side plaza extends west toward Morrison Drive, in the green space that runs through the Crown development. Next, please. And this is just a, an aerial drive-by. So this is from the Northwest, looking back onto our site from the intersection of Morrison and Fields. So you can begin to get a sense of the scale of the building and its placement toward the center of the site. Next, please. Again, moving east around Omega, looking just down the length of the entry, uh, the entry drive. You can begin to get a bit of a sense of the building scale relative to the scale of the, uh, the community. Next, please. Again, just moving eastward, you can begin to see the notch there in the building that would allow people from the entry to move underneath the building toward the stadium. This would be very similar to the Seneca Valley, perhaps, where you arrive to the stadium at the upper level and the, and the, and the stadium is below you. And then finally, uh, the last one, please. And then just moving all the way around the site, this is from the uh, southwest corner looking back. Next, please. So this is option two site plan. Again, north is up. Color coding is exactly the same. Points of access to the site are all the same. The stadium still at the lowest point of the site. But in this scheme, the building moves closer to the community and features a more prominent public plaza along Morrison Drive. 
The building plan rather than an L is essentially two parallel bars so that the narrow face that is presented by the building to the community is more in scale with the residential structures of the Crown development. There are still multiple plazas that traverse the site to create a common point of entry and access for all users of the school. Next, please. Again, just again, very quickly from the Northwest, looking back into the site, you can see that the building is much further forward at the center of the site and approaches and fronts Morrison Drive. Tennis courts and baseball make up most of the edge along Morrison. And the next, please. This is the arrival from fields. And then, so the arrival would be more of a procession around the softball field with lots of queuing space for parent pickup and drop off. Next, please. This one is from the Southwest. Again, just looking back, you can get a bit of sense. All the stadiums are below. So you arrive up above, uh, again, similar to Seneca Valley. Next, please. And then this one is more from the Southeast. Again, showing the massing and the integration of the building and the program areas with the slope of the site. Next, please. And then this is option three. And this one is a bit different. The building is also directly adjacent to the community, similar to option two, but has moved to the Northwest corner near the intersection of Morrison and Fields Road. The pedestrian connection to the community is more prominent in this scheme, perhaps more integrated with existing sidewalks along Fields Road, and also incorporates a gateway type feature on access with Vermeer Avenue, which is the first street south of and parallel to Fields. And, we'll, uh, and we'll, again, we'll see that in just a moment. This concept also locates the stadium and the associated lights and the noise and so forth furthest away from the community in the northeast corner of the site. Next, please. So again, this is from the Northwest, looking back that you can see where the word plaza is there. That is on access with Vermeer Drive. And so the arrival from Vermeer might be right up and through the building to this arrival plaza. Next, please. This is then showing the entrance to the school site from Fields Road. Again, the parent queuing area there, and then also the stadium that is immediately on your left. Next, please. And this is from the east uh, overlooking Omega Drive. Next, please. And then finally, from the southeast, looking back toward the building. Okay. Next, please. So you probably noticed that all the schemes anticipate as many as five stories, a building as many as five stories tall, and hopefully that these conceptual blocking and stacking massing diagrams offer a better sense of the possibility to do something really unique with this project in Montgomery County Public Schools in the city of Gaithersburg. And so those are also the three concepts we propose to use to introduce the project to the community and to identify and refine a preferred scheme through the community work session process. And that solution may not even be one of these three. We we're expect wide open to the possibility that could be an, an entirely different scheme that would grow out of that community dialogue. Next, please. Following our meeting this evening, we plan four community work sessions between the end of October and the middle of December, and hopefully, this will provide sufficient opportunity to gather and incorporate the community's feedback so we may establish design direction and establish a preferred concept by the end of this calendar year. Next slide, please. In order to keep the project on schedule, we've worked with MCPS to target a number of milestones, beginning with a schematic design submission to the Board of Education and the State Department of Education early 2022. So it's very important to make good progress with the community on the design of the school this fall. Next, please. As we thought about how to best facilitate these four work sessions, this slide illustrates a draft agenda for meeting number one, in which we treat that meeting more like a project kickoff meeting during which we would introduce the project, frame the many opportunities of the project, answer any general questions the community may have about the project, introduce some of the trends in contemporary school planning and design that might be relevant to this project, and receive any comments or concerns they may wish to share regarding the design of the school. Next, please. 
Meeting number two is where we propose to introduce the concepts that we've just shared with you and to do so in a way that acknowledges the feedback we received from work session number one. Hopefully we might be able to take one of the three concepts off the table for further development by the end of that meeting. In other words, is there one scheme that just under no circumstances do they wanna see anything like that? So could we take one scheme off the table by the end of work session two? Meeting number three would be similar to meeting number two, present refinements of the concepts and hopefully take another concept off the table. Such that, next please. In meeting number four, they would present refinements to the preferred concept. And though they've not been scheduled yet, we do anticipate sharing the outcomes of the community work session process with the Board of Education and the City Council again. And Mr. Adams, I think it's back to you. Yeah, so, and, and thank you, Mr. Jeffrey. I, I guess one thing I would say in terms of those, the community meetings, we, we know, you know, that there are, there are definitely things that uh, neighbors want to see from a, from a high school site, and there's definitely things that our, our school community will want to see. And it will be a balance. It, it will be a, a series of, of obviously trying to get to iterations, trying to get to something that, that makes the most sense. You know, I, I foresee, you know, many conversations around, you know, access uh, to the site. And we started to see a few of those connection points. You know, what does vehicular access look like? What does pedestrian access look like? Um, certainly when you talk about stadiums, you talk about athletic facilities, noise and lights, you know, is there an opportunity to, to uh, shield uh, some of the noisier uh, pieces of the site to you know, the, the, the locations that are, that are less residential? Um, so I, I, those will definitely be the driving you know, discussion points. Um, as Mr. Jeffrey mentioned, this will be a four or five story building. I, so I think the context of, of the community around it is going to be important. You know, we, while we do have larger, taller buildings, just to the, um, I guess, to the east of the site, you know, the, the residential certainly is going to be much smaller in scale, and we'll want to make sure that we, we right size of this uh, from, a, from a site development standpoint. Um, but, but I do think we have a, a great process to, to gather that feedback, and, and obviously, it's a school, so we, we want to spend a lot of time talking about the program and the great things that go on inside that school building throughout the day, too. So, so I know the site will be a big part of our community discussions, but, but we're, we are very excited to, uh, to, to look at this from an innovative school perspective and, and hopefully start to, to move in directions that are, that are very new to um, MCPS and new to this region from, from an academic perspective as well. Uh, so next slide. So we, we um, certainly this is this is for any community members that may be viewing. If if there's questions about the project, you know this is our, our point of contact for MCPS, um, and please feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, we we are again we are ahead of our community meeting uh, event. So if there are questions, we we would certainly say please please we encourage everyone to come out to these meetings and, and ask questions and be engaged. Um, and, and I would also say our, our Board of Education has not yet received this level of detailed briefing. So, so as we work through that community engagement process, we will be bringing back feedback to our Board of Education. Uh, so, so certainly um, they will be very integral as well in determining you know, everything from inside to outside of this building uh, and collecting all that feedback from, from uh, all the stakeholders involved, including mayor and council. Um, you know, in terms of, of what is going to be the best the best project for, for all involved. All right, next slide. Um, and, and again, we will continue to update our website along the way as well. Next slide. And I think we're at the point for question and answer. So, so we'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. I, I just have a, a couple questions and then I'll open it up. Um, First question is for you, Seth, and that is, well, actually, let me, let me, let me say thanks to Seth and to Dirk and to all of you for being here and for this terrific, exciting presentation. I mean, this is, this is the most fleshed out that we've seen, obviously, and um, I suspect the council members uh, join me in, in my excitement uh, over, over this becoming just more and more real. Um, so getting to the the technical public outreach question for you, Seth, first, 
you mentioned there's postcard mailers going out. Um, how, what's the methodology there for who's getting those mailers? Well, so this is a, this is going to be a, a, a fairly large um, reach project. Again, we mentioned all the clusters that are intended to be solved. So, so we will be obviously doing postcard mailers to, um, you know, a lot of the area of residents. So any, any uh, resident that lives in the proximity of the school will receive a postcard. But I think bigger than that, we, which we can't obviously do from postcard is going to be the messaging to all the other families that could potentially be impacted by this project. So all of the Gaithersburg cluster families, all of the Richard Montgomery cluster families, all of the Quince Orchard and, and so on families will be notified. So, so we, we, we do foresee a rather large turnout and, and we're, we're actually excited about that. You know, the, the, the more involved, the better the outcomes of the project, but postcards will be sent to immediate um, area, so pretty much the entire uh, new crown development, and you know any residents that are that are in that proximity. But this will have to be more of a um, uh, uh, an email blast of MCPS or connect eds to our families, um, and certainly, hopefully, we, we can work with uh, with the city team again because I think we were very successful with the Kelly Park outreach in in reaching as many um, city uh, stakeholders as well. Thank you, Seth. We're, you're talking about a, a big giant mailing, that's for sure. Um, so uh, the next question is for Dirk and and um, we do planning and zoning at the city. So so we we understand when something's like a preliminary concept, we're not looking at real architectural renderings. We understand that and, and going into this question, but you mentioned it in, during your presentation about the surrounding community and crown, the architectural features uh, that are part of all of, you know, the different styles and dormers and things to, that help uh, make the buildings more interesting. Is this, is, uh, is that sort of concept something that you envision for this school? Because I, you know, we, if we're, we're talking about a, a sort of a groundbreaking school education wise and, and, and how, it, how it's gonna fit into the community, how it's gonna serve the community. Um, how do you think architecturally that will be represented? Yeah, thank you for your question, Mayor. Um, I'll begin by saying that as, as, as Mr. Adams mentioned earlier, there's a lot of focus on the program, the academic program, instructional program, what happens inside the school. And, and our design approach tends to be uh, as holistic as it can be. And so we try to marry the building to the site as we tried to illustrate this evening. The site is rather small, and so the building, there's no room to waste. And so the building in the, in the, in the surround must be almost hand and glove. But we believe that design of school should occur from the inside out. It must work as a school from the inside out first. And we can work with the community uh, to develop the exterior. And so there are, I think every material <laughs> that might be available to a school is, is in use in, in the Crown development somewhere. And so we'll work with MCPS and the community and our construction manager to figure out what is the best way uh, to leverage those materials. But there's so many, there's so many different ways as you know to do that. Great. Um, appreciate that, that answer. So the, 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 my next comment, and then I'll open it up to the council and then it, eventually the public, is um, just sort of a, a general comment. This is not, uh, we staff internally sort of took a look at this. The, the negotiation, the whole crown process, we're talking about 15 plus years ago. Some of the negotiations started, or some of the crown processes started 20 years ago. Um, and you know the 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 30 acres or 31 acres uh, had a value in 2006, and it has a different value now. Um, it, internally, we we sort of did a, a calculation of what we thought that that the value of the land was, um, and our what our staff came up with was somewhere between seven and a half million dollars and 40 million dollars. Um, and you think that's a big, that's a big wide gap. Well, seven and a half million dollars with the school on it and $40 million at, at what planners call highest and best use. Um, either way, it's a, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big gift uh, from the city to MCPS and, and 
and we're we're delighted to uh, participate in that way and, and partner with MCPS as we have in the past. But another thing we've done with MCPS in the past with, with our facilities is come up with MOUs that have shared use agreements with various parts of the facility. And I wanted to, um, Seth, this is, this is more for you. And uh, I, I know the council and I would like to see our staff be at the table with you and negotiate uh, ways in which the city can partner as we have with places like Lakelands Park Middle uh, on shared use of facility. Are you guys open to that, Seth? Oh, absolutely. I mean, any anytime you can think about um, whether it even be co-location or um, different even type of partnerships to, to serve neighborhoods and kids, that's that's our business. So, you know, so, so anything that uh, that we can do to, to help in that, uh, we're, we're absolutely committed to, to working with, with you and, and council uh, to, to make that a reality. So, and yes, we, we, it is not, um, you know, without gratitude that, that uh, again, that we, we do understand that this was a huge commitment of, of mayor and, and, and council and, and the city as a whole to, to the school district. And as you can see, this, this school is going to have a huge impact on this county as a whole. So I, 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 I would say we, we are very grateful. Um, and, and I think uh, in advance, a lot of students, all the students that will ultimately uh, circulate through this, this building at some point will, will certainly be very thankful as well. So um, we are committed. And, and I think you know, we're, we're even looking to um, more innovative partnerships, even beyond what we've already experienced. So, so looking forward to those conversations. Excellent, excellent, and and we are uh, the, the gratitude is mutual for what you guys do every day and how you serve our community. Um, okay, I'm gonna. I see Neil Harris's hand. I'm gonna go to Neil first, and then Mike after. All right. So I have to uh, first of all echo the mayor's comments of being very excited by this. Uh, uh, what I see here in terms of the programmatic side is very exciting, and plus it's just so good to see this project moving forward and uh, it's been a long wait uh, I, you know I'm a little cynical side of me says if we have been you 15 years would we have this school built already but we're not going to do that today a um, couple of quick questions that are maybe less pertinent to the conversation we've already had but I've noticed that at some of our high schools where football is popular uh, there is uh, a need for overflow parking beyond what would normally be programmed for the regular academic day of the school. And it has a pretty significant effect on the surrounding neighborhood. Have you folks looked at where overflow parking would go and if there's available or is it the concern that would come up is, is this just gonna choke off all the street parking in the neighborhood on uh, fo big football game days? And certainly um, that will be part of our, our community engagement process. I, I think we actually have a, a really good opportunity here um, because there are uh, you know, adjacent parking lots that we could certainly take advantage of on those, those you know, large, large event days. Um, what it will really boil down to is making sure you know, for, from a pedestrian safety perspective, from an access perspective, it's well thought out. And, and we, we hopefully enter into some form of, a, of agreements um, with, with folks. But yes, parking in, in residential neighborhoods, you know, clogging up streets, that is not something that, uh, you know, that we support. And, and we will certainly look for ways to, to alleviate that. At, at the same time, I, I do think, um, you know, we, we also don't want to, you know, pave over this entire site. I think, you know, part of the trends in, in public education and even um, you know, other other institutional and commercial buildings is trying to minimize as much as possible. You know, some of that uh, uh, that surface parking space. So, so for us, I think it's going to be a it's going to be a balance, and and I ultimately I think the final result will be the outcome of that engagement. You know, engagement with obviously community, but also with uh, some of the the commercial folks that are in the area to see if we can take advantage of 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 this uh, location. All right, that sounds great. And just one other note, and I'm sure you're aware of this, as in uh, the people are somewhat re change resistant often, and I, we're, you're offering a wonderful new facility with great programs, but 
Um, I've seen this before. When Lakelands Park was first built, people were very upset about their kids being moved out of Ridgeview, which they were very happy with at the time, into, into this new unknown school. Now they wouldn't want to go back for love or money. Um, somehow, MCPS hopefully will work on the messaging that's going to go out to all these different schools and clusters uh, where the parents are comfortable uh, to show them the benefits of this new, pro new unknown program. I know it's a tall order, and I know that MCPS gets a lot of uh, pushback on these sorts of things. So hopefully you can work on messaging the benefits and not uh, in a way that reduces that sort of pushback, because that makes things difficult for everybody. Until the, until the school is up and running, people don't know and, you know, get nervous, understandably, because it's their kid's future. Oh, absolutely. We, we, we certainly um, understand the importance of communication on, on any boundary and school assignment uh, process. So, um, you know, we, we have gone through the uh, district-wide analysis, and, and that will influence, you know, much of our communication on this as well. And, and uh, we are actually scheduled to open uh, another school a year, currently a year ahead of this. So um, we'll be fresh on the heels of, of uh, another large boundary study right, right before this. So um, messaging will, will be loud and clear in this county, I, I believe for, for the next several years as we're, as we're talking school assignments. Um, but I do think, you know, Mr. Murphy and, and you know, his work and from a programming side, you know, as we as we really are focusing on on career and technology education, and we're thinking about innovative programs, you know, the the idea of choice, um, you know, certainly one that I think will will get a lot of parents excited, and and one that we we'd love to continue to explore at all of our schools, um, you know, so that uh, you know everyone does start to get really excited about you know this being a, a county school district with all great schools, so. But, but yes, messaging will be loud and clear and, and very, uh, very concise. And, and, and I think there will be uh, many, many involved in, in that process. All right, I think that last point you made is, is super critical and I've seen it work elsewhere where uh, if you show people that there is choice and there are some innovative, desirable programs that will make it so that people wanna go there rather than wanna stay where they are. Sounds great, sounds like you're on the right track, thank you. Thanks, Neil. We're going to go to Mike and then Rob. Hey, thank you. Um, I guess I'll continue the thread that, that you just got done talking with. Uh, and, and thank everybody for the presentation. Uh, this is very exciting. Um, uh, I believe uh, we actually completed the annexation agreement in early 2007. Um, and we'd always talked about this. Well, Clearly, I think it was a vision of the of the council at the time and many in the community that it made sense to preserve a significant portion of the Crown Farm site for this school school. So it's really exciting to see it, see how it's progressed at this point. Um, so I guess I wanted to talk again, go back to this issue of boundaries. So Seth, when you, you identified the five, uh, clusters, uh, you named three of them specifically, Quince Orchard, Gaithersburg, and uh, Richard Montgomery. You didn't mention Wooten or, uh, or Northwest. So I was just wondering if you can give us, and you told us the, what the uh, issues with capacity were at those three schools. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you can tell us about the capacity at Northwest and at uh, Wooten. Well, yeah, so that, that was certainly not, uh... Not an omission, um, you know. As they're not <laughs> essentially, they, they are part of. They will be part of this this school project and the, the boundary. So Northwest is um, projected to be 345 students over. Wooten, on the other hand, is is scheduled to have available seats. Um, so certainly that they are going to be part of it. You know, absolutely because of geography and, and proximity. Um, you know, but the other schools that identified were were by far the highest over projected overutilized. Um, you know, we, we are going to have more discussions about the scope of the boundary. You know, when, when we talk about schools that are impacted, that is a little premature ahead of a Board of Education's determination of the final, final um, uh, scope of boundary. So, um, for example, when we went through the Gaithersburg number nine, you know, we, we talked about 
the schools. We've had we had great conversations with with council, um, but ultimately it was a superintendent recommendation, and the board of ed made the, made a final decision on the which schools um, were were part of that boundary study and which ones were not. The same will, will happen for this particular project. We we have identified um, essentially the schools that would uh, would benefit from from this from a capacity standpoint. Um, so, so those are the identified ones. We, we still have heard, we've heard from our superintendent and board that they would like to see Rockville High School included. Um, we've heard from others that Churchill, uh, you know, because of their overutilization should be included. Um, so, so again, the, the board will ultimately make that final determination. But um, at the end of the day, you know, we still also have to justify the number of seats we're constructing. And when you start to add up all these overutilized schools and the number of seats that that they're missing, then then the number of, of capacity you know starts to make sense. Then we start to maximize our state um, contribution because the state you know the state of Maryland is involved in this from a funding perspective. So so all of it goes hand in hand. But um, yes, I apologize if I if I misled some by saying thinking they were not or they were, but. Ultimately, this is just us from a staff level saying these are the schools that are overutilized. And then ultimately, at a future CIP, the Board of Education will make that final determination of the scope. And that will be a whole process unto itself. So even, even though the right. scope is set, you know, obviously, we go through that very, very long, elaborate process to, to look at all the different scenarios involved. Well, thank you. I, you know, I was going to ask these capacity questions anyway, but uh, I'm glad, uh, uh, but I wanted to get those other two school uh, clusters in the record as having been discussed. Uh, I participated uh, pretty actively in the 1996 boundary discussion that resulted in uh, the articulation plans for, uh, uh, for Northwest, which had a big effect on, big impact on the school community at Quince Orchard. Uh, clearly, uh, boundary discussions are very, you know, a very sensitive issue, and you learn about people things that you never expected in that process. So, um, and there were a lot of uh, different. Well, it, it's one of those difficult things to go through. Uh, I'm glad that I don't have children uh, in uh, that will be affected, but I do have two grandchildren that are likely to be affected by this boundary. So, uh, and I know my colleagues also have children as well, who, who young children who will uh, be affected by this. So there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, I would say that, that um, you know, the biggest impact in my school community was uh, the one school in the, in the Quince Orchard cluster at the time, whose total enrollment area is within the city limits of Gaithersburg was articulated to Northwest High School. Uh, for some people, that still sticks in the craw, but I think most people have gotten used to it as these schools have developed. So anyway, uh, I, I imagine that we'll have similar discussions. And then, you know, just now you mentioned three other clusters that might be part of the discussion. So, you know, the ripple effects of this are going to be pretty big. Uh, but I think, you know, this is there's a real opportunity here uh, in terms of uh, the programming at this school that might create some interest. So I wanted to get to the programming. So is the concept of a magnet or an IB program on the table for this school or is MCPS moving away from uh, magnet and IB kind of designations? And, and I'll certainly turn it over to Mr. Murphy, but I would say, you know, one of the goals of community engagement is also to talk through programming. Um, so, so again, I, I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves or even ahead of our Board of Education, but I, I think Scott can give uh, some really good, you know, updates around where we're headed and, and hopefully that'll help in, in that discussion. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me again. Scott Murphy, Director of College and Career Readiness. Um, and just to respond to that question, I just want to again emphasize what was covered very, very briefly um, regarding program. But what we know, and as we look across the country, the, the high schools of the future are tightly, tightly aligned to the economy, which is a heavy dose of STEM, a heavy dose of IT, the life sciences, all that just which happen to be in, in this community in terms of our industry here in the Gaithersburg area and Montgomery County. Uh, the high schools of the future are not only high tech, but provide lots of opportunities for college credit. Uh, what was referred to as dual enrollment, where students earn 
college credit, high school credit at the same time, which again, just geographically, um, here we are right next door to Montgomery College, the University of Shady Grove, just prime, prime, prime opportunities for partnerships with industry, with post-secondary, and, and the list goes on. Um, when we talk about that kind of vision for a high school, um, you know, that's going to be of interest to a lot of people, a lot of kids, a lot of parents, a lot of, and our community. Um, and so what we're envisioning is a model that it's not just the boundary that's drawn around that school, but also access for a wider range of students in a wider geographic area. Um, I'll cite the example that's now in place at Seneca Valley, uh, where students from a wider geographic region uh, have access to apply into Seneca Valley. We don't refer to it as much as a magnet program anymore, but it's similar concept in that a wider geographic region has access to the programs at the school. So that kind of model uh, that we've begun at Seneca Valley is very much at the foundation here uh, through that theme of, of choice and really interest-driven opportunities for students and families to access um, these, these new and innovative programs. Okay, thank you. I guess um, one comment about, about that and, you know, coming from it as a scientist, but also knowing the, the, the talent and uh, uh, the potential of students in the Montgomery uh, County Public Schools, I would uh, suggest that we, we look at STEAM rather than just STEM, uh, throw in the arts. Uh, you know, we know a lot of people that are engaged, a, a lot of our young, young people who are excellent students in, in all academic fields also have a great interest in, in the performing cultural arts, et cetera. So I think this is a, you know, a great opportunity here. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. And I guess the last question I had is about uh, the entry points into the school site. Maybe we'll go back to Seth. Uh, it looks like an option three and option two, there's actually an entry, uh, a street entry from Morrison into uh, those, those sites. And in option three, that actually extends, I think basically, I think the street is Armstrong to Omega. So it's almost a straight shot uh, that there's, there's an entry on both, on both sides of the property. And, and basically um, it allows that connection. And, and I didn't see that in option one, which is actually the, the plan that I, I, I probably like the most, but I understand how preliminary we are though. But what I noticed about option one is there really wasn't any entry from, from the Crown neighborhood at all. Um, that, that basically any traffic, you know, those, that community is walking distance. So we don't expect a lot, but there will still be uh, traffic uh, and people would have to drive up the fire through the neighborhood up to Fields Road to gain entry to the school. Um, anyway, I just wanted to uh, uh, learn a little bit more about that that connection, especially that one in option three. Yeah, and 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 I would say too. So the again, those connection points are are probably mm -hmm. going to be, um, you know, our our lengthiest discussion with community. You know, what we've what we've learned over the years is. Um, you know, drop-offs for students need need to be uh, convenient for, for parents. Otherwise, they look for easier options that maybe you know don't don't necessarily follow those, and and they create um, bottlenecks and you know traffic jams in neighborhoods that are that are not intended. Um, so when I think when we when we're going to start talking about connections to the crown development, one of the, one of the, the weighing factors is. Um, obviously, we want to have great connectivity to the development, um, but do we want that to be more of a pedestrian and bicycle connectivity, or do we want to have some vehicular connectivity? Um, you know, I, I think where it is located, it's not going to be, you know, necessarily that easy to get to uh, traveling through the neighborhood, so, so hopefully it will be more of just a neighborhood access point. But I think that's what we're going to have to weigh with the community. Um, we're going to have to talk through the pros and cons. Um, talk through traffic counts, talk through, um, you know, what, what happens on, you know, uh, game, game nights and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, what, what we do know is that, you know, a, a bus access and a car access are ideal. Uh, a third access or, or sometimes just an exit only, um, particularly when it's leaving from student um, parking areas is 
also very desirable, but um, we're, we're definitely gonna wanna think this through and we're gonna wanna work with the community to make sure uh, we, we don't create um, these log jams back in that neighborhood. And, and, and I do think if there's opportunities for it to be more pedestrian bicycle friendly, that, that may be a way to solve some of those uh, access problems. But, uh, but, but yes, we, we will spend quite a bit of time and, and work through those details with, with all involved. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think we want to uh, weigh in on what would be our preference, because I think our preference is, is really just um, ease of access and convenience uh, to ensure that uh, you know we don't create unnecessary safety issues or or um, neighborhood issues along the way. Okay, uh, thank you. And I guess you know uh, I'm looking forward to to seeing the renderings of these of the building eventually, and hope for the compatibility with the architecture in the adjacent neighborhoods, the communities, uh, rather than an institutional kind of massive five story building. Um, I, I did notice that not, neither of the three options includes an internal courtyard such as we have at, at Gaithersburg, um, Gaithersburg High School or Quince Orchard High School. And, you know, those schools are separated by about 30 years in terms of when they were built. So uh, just curious if, if that might end up being part of the mix here. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing, but um, I know it's very premature, but I'm hoping for some really distinctive architecture that would... Uh, you know, create a, a different sense of place, both for an educational environment, but also a cultural kind of core center in the community. So thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Mike. We'll go to Rob Wu. Thanks, Mayor. And thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation tonight. Um, I, I think it takes a, a lot of guts to come before us and present us with stuff that the Board of Ed hasn't even seen. And I kind of appreciate that. Um, and, and I appreciate the fact specifically that you put renderings out there that are, you know, give us opportunity to, to, to think on this and to noodle on it. And I, I echo the, the, the comments of my colleagues about, you know, when you're looking at these things, it really gets the brain juices flowing on how this is going to integrate into the surrounding community. So I'll echo um, the, the comments on those. Um, one thing that I, I, I kind of also noticed in looking at the, the renderings is, you know, it, it, it kind of looks like a high school. Um, and I focused on the fact that there's, there's two ball fields there and, you know, a, a football stadium. Um, and I, I wanted to feel you out on kind of the concept, you know, there's been a lot of discussion as we have less space to utilize to provide for the education of our children on innovative um, school concepts. You know, schools that might not look like a, a um, school would in a suburban area because now it's in an urban area. Um, and I also was kind of, you know, thinking about what Scott was just saying. And so Scott and I have had discussions in the past on um, innovative school programs surrounding STEM and how you foster the pipeline from high schools into the, the local ecosystem. And so one of the things I just wanted to kind of throw out there is, you know, if we're thinking about innovative and not just iterative, but innovative concepts for developing that pipeline. Um, one of the things that, that I, I would throw out there to think about is um, kind of building a, a ecosystem for that. And so you, when you talk about like, you know, Silicon Valley and now Austin, I guess, you talk about building the ecosystem for innovation. And so, you know, for example, with the army, um, the army wanted to get into high tech. And so in order to join the ecosystem, it was actually sending soldiers into incubators, into collider spaces and things like that to learn what it is to do high tech. Um, I, I'm kind of thinking about whether that's a concept that we could emulate here. You know, I was looking at the two ball fields and the, um, the track and saying, do we all, do we need all that space for recreation or could we build what some jurisdictions have been focusing on, which are uh, high school focused startup incubators um, and not something that's inside the school, but perhaps an outbuilding, an outbuilding that, you know, kind of whether it's, you know, accessing USG or accessing Montgomery College or accessing local businesses to come in and create kind of incubator space outside of the high school where our students can walk across the street and 
access that space rather than you know going a few blocks away to do internships somewhere. Um, and I'm also wondering if you know if, if that space is reserved, maybe it doesn't even have to be funded as part of the initial ask for the school, but you reserve the space and then you we fundraise from you know Montgomery College, USG, the county, the state, companies, things like that to fund that truly innovative space where students can progress from you know the, the high school courses to the college courses and beyond in an environment that is really uh, geared towards accelerating them and not just giving them credits for what they're going to do. So just throwing that out as an idea. Oh, thank, thank you for that. And, and um, you know, certainly, you know, Scott can, can, you know, talk to, you know, some of those innovative programmatic elements. But, but one thing I would say is, um, you know, when it comes to fields and athletics, um, we, we have explored uh, schools without those and, and definitely overwhelmingly heard that, that you know, uh, parents and families want to have those experiences, even if, if it, you know, even if there were opportunities with close proximity to athletic facilities, you know, I, I think, you know, back to comment earlier about making sure that, you know, families um, that are, that are boundaried into the school have the same opportunities and experiences that they're coming from is going to be a big part of that. Um, but beyond that, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, and one of the things we, we, uh, we just, we, we created a new, and I'll just give you an example of this, we created a new sustainability division uh, this past year. And, you know, we're working with our curriculum folks to look at, at our properties differently. We're looking at, you know, are there ways to create, um, you know, incubators, test spaces for, let's say, sustainable agriculture, um, looking at ways for, you know, green energy energy production and, and how to, to integrate that into to, to, to the classroom and have easy access to it. So we're looking at very unique ways to provide access to kids. Um, but but one thing that you also said is very accurate is that we do have to rely on, on the businesses and, and uh, local expertise, um, you know, in, in working through some of this. So, so I think this one is going to be complicated where I think we try to thread the needle with both. Um, but I, I, I don't want to walk away from this meeting thinking that we won't have fields and, and uh, athletics um, because we definitely tried that, you know, we went down that road for one school and, and definitely heard loud and clear from, from communities as well as our Board of Education that, that uh, are, they want to make sure our schools are equitable in, in terms of, of those types of amenities as well. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting taking away Friday Night Lights. I mean... Uh, based on my observations of how the mayor engages with Quince Orchard High School, it, it is it is integral to the fabric of the community. But you know, to the extent that we don't need, for example, a, a softball field and a baseball field, or you can do some kind of efficiency while maintaining that kind of um, school community. All right, thanks, Rob. Um, we're gonna go Ryan. And then I, after Ryan, I have one more quick question on a different topic, uh, but so we'll, we'll do Ryan first and then we'll get to that and then we'll go to the phone. Thanks, Mayor. Let me start by thanking everybody for the presentation again and echoing what's already been said about how excited we all are. Um, it is really great to see that we've come this far in the process and that hopefully we'll be moving quickly with the next several phases. A um, couple of questions. Uh, first, um, this came up in our discussion of the elementary school at Kelly Park, and obviously there are different considerations for elementary versus high schools, but can you talk to us a little bit about whether you have thought out um, issues of community access, uh, neighbor access to um, the outdoor uh, facilities uh, and open space uh, that are gonna be part of the school grounds here? And, and, and yes, that, that will be, um, part of that engagement. I think it's, it's the outdoor spaces, but it's also or even our indoor spaces. So, so we do know, um, you know, our high schools are used almost 24 uh, seven, you know, gymnasiums, cafeterias, uh, weekend, um, religious services, you know, you name it, th these spaces are, are used. So, uh, you know, a big part of our outdoor design, and, and as you saw from some of those concepts, trying to take advantage of the grade, um, 
but it's also ensuring that we have ADA compliance to all of our outdoor amenities, um, which which has not always been the case in outdoor amenities. So this these projects, absolutely, that's that's at the heart of of our of our access. But if we can create connections um, to communities, you know, to to find adjacencies to the park and other green spaces in the in the neighborhood, we definitely want to do that and um, look for as many of those sort of sort of soft trail access points along the way uh, to to keep this um, feeling like a a community school, a community resource for for folks there um, after school hours as well. So I, I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but um, Yes, just making sure that you know it's the access is clean, it it, it flows nicely. Um, you're not you're not seeing barriers of parking lots in between, you know, amenities that are, could be used for the public um, after hours and those sorts of things. So that, that will definitely be a big part of the, the design iteration. Yeah, I mean we're not we're not making any final decisions obviously tonight, but I wonder to what extent that that aspect um, helps. Uh, impact uh, which layout option, you know, ultimately might be selected when you're talking about, for example, you know, having ball fields and tennis courts located closer to the residential community that's adjacent versus having them be on the other side of the property uh, with a, you know, with the school building in between, those kinds of things, um, you know, in terms of the connectivity that you talked about, Seth, you know, I, I imagine that will all come into play and I just kind of wanted to flag it. Absolutely, and I think too one one thing that we we don't want to lose. It, we I heard a comment about the uh, the courtyard. You know, a lot of times courtyards are used obviously for for natural natural light, but it's it's also when you think about it, you think about student movement within a building. You know, going from point A to point point C. As you start to get into these buildings that are you know being a bit more um, condensed because of of the site constraints. You know, we also have to take a look back, look into the building, and and say to ourselves. How long would it take for a student to get from the fourth floor on this side of the building to the let's say the gymnasium at that other end of the building and so that'll you know we're, we're going to look at it all but that's that's one piece that we will not overlook uh, because we don't want to have um, uh, shortcomings inside the building either so it's, it's definitely going to be a balancing act understood um one other thing i wanted to raise and i'm not really sure this has any significant impact on the work that you're doing right now but i just wanted to raise it for something to throw into the mix and consider. Um, about a quarter mile away from the site on Decoverly Drive, we have set aside a significant right away for future CCT stop. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened since the time that we set that uh, space aside, and it's not clear whether there will be a CCT, what it will look like, what route it will have, what stations it will have, when it will uh, ever come to fruition if it does. But having said that, it's still a possibility. And um, it's still a possibility that it will have um, either a route or a station um, within very close proximity of the school site. And I just want to make sure that for transportation planning purposes, for, uh, you know, uh, human sort of movement flow of people in and out of uh, the area around the school site, that that's something that's sort of also considered and factored into the mix. Again, we don't, you know, it's hard because it's such a hypothetical at this point. We don't really know when, when and where, and you know, um, how significant uh, that infrastructure will be. Um, but I think we ought to sort of just be aware of it as we're proceeding. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I, I do think this is um, certainly a project where where partnerships are, are going to be critical. So obviously working with your city planners and transportation experts, um, but obviously bringing in the county too, because again, having such a broad reach, you know, we, we need to make sure we're all um, on the same page in terms of, of, of project goals and making sure we understand the implications um, and opportunities. So thank you for, for flagging that. And we, we will certainly, uh, you know, keep an eye on that and obviously work with, with the city uh, transportation folks on next steps. Thank you. So um, one last question, and this is off this topic, but since we have you in front of us, um, we're all looking very closely at the Gaithersbury Elementary School number nine boundary study process. 
um, maybe maybe this is one for Adrian. Um, hi, Adrian. Um, maybe so. The, the question is when I know the vote from the Board of Ed was deferred on this. Do we have a date? Do we know when they're going to actually come? You know, look at this agenda item. So the boundary study for Gaithersburg number eight will come out as part of this CIP process. So the superintendent releases the CIP at the end of October. Um, typically a boundary study comes out about a week before. So you can expect it in the next week or so that it will be out. And as soon as it is, I will let you know so that you could post it on your website as well. But of course it will be on our website as well. Um, we have our first presentation with the Board of Education on October 25th. And at that time, we will be going through the superintendent's recommendation for the boundary study. The um, board will go through their process, work session, of course, public hearings are all set. Um, and then the board acts, um, I believe it's November 18th on the uh, CIP as well as the boundary study. Perfect, thank you. Yep. And I got the number wrong, I said number nine, but it was, I meant number eight. Thank you, Adrian, you, you, knew, you knew what I meant. Um, all right, so this is the time where we, we like to give anybody in the public a chance to ask a question or make a comment. Um, tech team, can you please play the instructional video for anybody who'd like to speak tonight? Good evening. If you've connected to the meeting tonight via Zoom and you're on a desktop or a laptop and you wish to make a public comment, we can't currently see or hear you. What you need to do, please, is wiggle your mouse around and look towards the bottom center of your screen. You should see a raise hand button. Go ahead and click on that now for us, please. Alternatively, if you've connected in via telephone, you can press star nine. Thank you, tech team. So um, I see one hand raised. We ask that you keep your comments no more than three minutes. State your name and address or neighborhood for the record. Um, tech team, can you bring up Dave Belgard, please? Thank you, Mayor. My name is Dave Belgard of Washington County Woods. And before I start a comment, I just want to say with all the community forums we've been doing recently where we only get one minute to speak, three minutes feels like an absolute luxury. Thank you. Um, I know it's a little bit premature to discuss the, 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 the boundary studies, but I do just want to say, um, having talked to a lot of residents uh, about the Kelly Park School, uh, there's um, a lot of historical dissatisfaction in Gaithersburg about what happened with Forest so, Oaks, and that informs a lot of fear about what's going to happen with Kelly Park. And I'm sure we're going to encounter similar types of fear about boundaries involving this school. I grew up being able, being able to walk to my elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, and the sense of community, community that created was wonderful. So uh, I'll be very interested to see how that boundary study goes. Um, there was some discussion about parking. Um, and Mr. Adams mentioned during that, that you know we don't want to pave over the whole site. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, personally, I have a preference for structured parking in general, especially with the growing density of our city. We're not getting more land back and uh, using vast amounts of land for parking space uh, to me is a shame. Uh, I know that's not a normal thing for schools, but I hope that kind of outside the box thinking uh, may be included uh, while while uh, designing the, the kind of final design for this uh, uh, school. And um, really the final thing that I'd like to mention is transit. Uh, I forgot who, who uh, mentioned it, but, but uh, the idea of bike accessibility and walking accessibility may be an important feature of this. And I think it really should be. Uh, first of all, we have a lot of community members around that school that would be able to bike or walk to it. Um, but even beyond that, uh, I know that, 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 that part of the discussion is you know, this kind of a new model where, where people from all around are able to, to come to the school. With that, uh, I think it may be important to, to look at how to incorporate better um, public transit options, ensure that, ensure that there's appropriate uh, bus stops that, that are within easy walking access of the school. Uh, so just a number of thoughts that, that I had on the school that I, that I wanted to share. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, I don't see any other hands at this moment. So we're gonna end our public, our public testimony here. Um, and Seth, if you wanted to respond to that, you're welcome to, otherwise, uh, we can encourage Dave and others to go to the to attend the work session at uh, the Board of Ed on uh, 
October 28th. Is that the first one? Uh, yeah, so so I, I would strongly encourage, um, particularly for well, talking about this project, to attend the, the public meetings, um, you know, to, to bring up ideas such as, you know, structured parking. In terms of the boundary study, uh, the we're, we'll have to finalize when the public hearing for this particular topic will, will for the number eight boundary, but uh, we will certainly share that with city staff so so that you can post it on your website uh, for for all that are watching to uh, to be able to attend both the public hearing for the Parksburg Kelly Kelly Park School, but also for the the public uh, meetings for this particular Crown High School project as well. Perfect. Uh, well, with that, then unless staff, Dennis, Tanisha, I'm not sure if anybody has anything else. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to let these guys go. We'll go to our second discussion topic. Not seeing anything from anybody. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so our next discussion item is a review of recommendations from our subcommittee. Uh, being Mike Sesma and Ryan Spiegel on mayor and council personnel policies. And I guess I'm going to turn it over to Lynn here to lead us off. Lynn, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as the mayor said, this is a follow up to a work session that we had back in May on May 10th uh, to talk about the development of personnel policies uh, dealing particularly with elected officials. Um, a question was raised based on some incidents that occurred in other jurisdictions of what policies the city had in place that would impact uh, potential misconduct from elected officials. And really under the you know, current city code and charter, there, there's not a lot there. Um, text me if you could please pull up the PowerPoint starting on packet page 51. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so based on that discussion that we did have back in May, uh, a council subcommittee was appointed being council member Sesma and Spiegel. And uh, also both myself and city manager Barley participated in that process. Uh, next slide, please. So tonight we're gonna do a brief uh, review of some of the current mechanisms to hold elected officials accountable. And then here are the subcommittee's recommendations. And then hopefully finally at the end, get some guidance from the mayor and council as to how they'd like to proceed with this issue. Next slide, please. So we're gonna do again, a brief overview of uh, the current state of the law. And we did discuss this back in May, but this is a little bit of a refresher. Uh, so there is a provision of the Maryland constitution that would provide that if a elected official is found guilty of either a felony or a misdemeanor um, while they are in office, that uh, they can be removed from office. Um, the misdemeanors deal with activities related to the elected official's public duties and responsibilities. It would include the misdemeanors of malfeasance, misfeasance, nonfeasance, and misconduct in office. And next slide, please. Uh, so these types of misdemeanors are very, very rare. Um, in the history of Maryland, there have only been a couple of cases where this has been, uh, where there have been criminal charges, misdemeanor charges against elected officials, and those are typically handled by the state prosecutor's office. Next slide, please. There is also a provision in the city charter that allows for recall, that's section 6C31. Um, recall can occur by a petition signed by 20% or more qualified voters in the city. Next slide, please. So we've included on this slide a list of different items. Um, a recall petition has to include a specific reason for the recall. Um, so uh, section 6C32 does set forth the, uh, the available recall provisions. So really these uh, under current law, these are really the only two bases of when someone could be removed from office. There would have to either be a recall process that was initiated by the public, or there would have to be a conviction of a felony or a misdemeanor involving uh, some type of conduct in office. Uh, 
Aside from that, there are no provisions in current law that allow for disciplinary removal of an elected official under the city charter and code or in state law. So next slide, please. So it was with this really background that the subcommittee met to talk about whether we should include some provisions in the city code and charter uh, to address areas of misconduct by elected officials. Uh, so the committee, the subcommittee has recommended so that a new section to the city charter would be section 17 um, be included that would provide for an automatic forfeiture uh, from office uh, for a couple of items. The first would be if the elected official moved outside of the city limits, no one kept the residency in the city. Um, you may think that that's already covered in the charter. Uh, there are provisions in both section four of the charter, which deals with council members and section 15 of the charter that deals with the mayor that does require the mayor and council to reside uh, within the city limits. However, those provisions don't have a penalty included as to what happens uh, if the elected official would move outside of the city limits. Uh, so the second proposal would be that a uh, member of the mayor and council um, who was convicted of a final non-appealable conviction of a felony would be automatically removed from office. And then finally, and this was an area that the subcommittee had a lot, a lot of discussion about uh, deals with missing meetings. Um, the, the final recommendation of the subcommittee uh, would require automatic removal from office for missing six or more consecutive meetings without excuse. Um, and I wanna stress that without excuse. Uh, the proposed charter amendment um, does allow excused absences by notification of the city clerk. It also does not include absences due to military service. Um, and it does allow the council to make exceptions for disability or other unusual circumstances. Uh, next slide, please. The second um, provision in Article 17 authorizes the council to create personnel policies via regulation. Um, and I will remind the mayor and council that section 210 of the city code allows you all to adopt resolutions following introduction. Um, and then it's discretionary whether you hold a public hearing, but then there would be final policy discussion on those regulations. It also allows that those regulations include enforcement provisions for violations of the regulations up to and including removal from office. So next slide, please. Um, so the subcommittee is also recommending the adoption of regulations. And again, there's a draft copy of the regulations included in your packet this evening. Um, so it would, the regulations would establish prohibited con misconduct, should be misconduct instead of conduct. Um, or I guess it is prohibited conduct. Um, a complaint and investigation process, a hearing process, um, action by the mayor and council on complaints and then enforcement options. Uh, next slide, please. So providing a little bit more detail um, to the process, the draft regulations really do focus on complaints of discrimination and harassment. Um, under the process, a complaint could be initially made to either the director of human resources or myself or my office. Um, we have ensured that complaints would always be investigated by an outside investigator, would not be done by, by city staff. It also establishes a joint hearing process um, that would provide due process to any individual who uh, is subject to the complaint. And then a recommendation to the mayor and council. Um, I want to talk a little bit about in a little bit more detail about the joint hearing process. Um, some of the discussion of the subcommittee really focused on um, what agency should hold hearings, you know, to provide that due process element. So these would be a quasi judicial um, hearing. So um, the, really the options that the subcommittee looked at was the ethics commission or the personnel review board. And both of those commissions have you know, different strengths related to these types of investigations and these types of issues. 
Um, we did talk to uh, the chairs of the Ethics Commission and the Personnel Review Board to kind of get their, their input um, on this issue. And actually they were the ones who recommended that, you know, maybe this should be a joint um, process between the Ethics Commission and the Personnel Review Board. Um, both of those boards are relatively small. They each have three members. Um, so there was some thought of having the larger, the larger board that would bring both the, the ethics component as well as the personnel component um, would be a, a good option to hear these types of complaints. Um, next slide, please. So once under the regulations, once this joint hearing board would hold a, again, quasi-judicial hearing, um, they would gather the evidence, they would make a final decision, which would come to the mayor and council um, with findings of fact, conclusions of the law. Uh, but it would be the mayor and council who would make the final determination on a complaint. Um, the proposed regulations do, do provide that, you know, clearly the, the elected official who is subject to the complaint could not participate. Um, mayor Ashton will be happy to know that we did give a, the mayor a vote um, on this. Uh, on this particular issue, uh, because we are requiring a supermajority, we would need four votes to sustain a complaint. And then the final decision of the mayor council would be made in a public meeting and would be by resolution, again, including findings of fact and conclusions of law, because it would be appealable up to um, circuit court. Next slide, please. Uh, so we also looked at what type of enforcement mechanisms that we thought were appropriate for sustained complaints and decided that those should include a cease and desist order, which would basically be an order to um, stop the particular conduct. And again, that would be enforceable by the circuit court. Uh, remedial training, removal from committees or other assignments, a former censure process, and then finally, uh, the most extreme enforcement mechanism removal from office. Next slide, please. So we've also included provisions in the regulations that would prohibit retaliation uh, for an individual making a complaint. It would prohibit making false statements or representations in relation to a complaint. And it would require harassment and discrimination training every two years for elected officials. Um, I do wanna note that city employees are currently required to do harassment election, or excuse me, harassment and discrimination training every two years as well. Uh, so that would uh, be part of that process be handled by our human resources department. Um, next slide, please. So in order to establish the joint hearing uh, board process that the regulations anticipate, this would also require amendments to section 7A2 and section 1713.1 of the city code. And this would be to grant both the ethics commission and the personnel review board of the authority to participate as a joint hearing board. Um, next and final slide, please. Uh, so this evening, we're looking for some discussion from the mayor and council and uh, provide guidance to staff on the, the draft of the charter code and regulation proposals. Um, so we can determine whether we should proceed with introduction of these uh, proposed amendments and, uh, you know, and or certainly any changes that you all think are appropriate. Um, so with that, I will open it up for questions, but I don't know if Ryan and Mike may want to say a few words before we, uh, we jump into a lot of questions. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lynn. That's a very good summary. Um, I think it reflects our discussion. It was also at times not an easy discussion, but I think we, we, we got to the right place on this. Um, uh, this morning uh, at the uh, fall meeting of the Maryland Municipal League, I sat at breakfast with uh, some folks from uh, a couple of other cities on the Eastern shore uh, and actually mentioned that, you know, everybody wants to know what's, what's, What's going on in your city? And I said, "Oh, we have a work session tonight. We're hearing about a new high school possibility, and we're we're talking about this this ordinance that we don't have." And it turns out that it's uh, the situation isn't as infrequent uh, as we might think. There are a couple of cities actually in on the eastern shore that have uh, are going through this now or have gone through it recently. 
And then the, the other issue that came up was last week, the city of Seat Pleasant uh, voted to dismiss their mayor uh, for missing uh, three consecutive uh, meetings without an excuse. Now this mayor's had uh, other issues before with the council, with the current council and the, and the previous council. Uh, I guess the biggest surprise about the Seat Pleasant issue is that the mayor has not appealed uh, this, this decision or does not seem to be uh, wanting to take any further action to, to try and be reinstated. So anyway, um, I guess what was interesting is the, the number of consecutive meetings that, that is in the charter for that, uh, for that city and how they decided to, how, and that as being a determining factor. I think the, the number we came up with was one quarter of the regular meetings uh, in a year for uh, the city council. So we have about 26 meetings a year, maybe 24 given holidays, et cetera. Um, uh, so, you know, one quarter would be about six meetings, uh, consecutive meetings. So consecutive meetings is a, it's a pretty big issue, right? That, that would be uh, over three months uh, missing consecutive uh, meetings of the mayor and council, where actually we do the business of the council, we take votes, et cetera. Um, so it was just interesting to, to know that, that other cities uh, have gone through this recently. Um, and I guess the question is, well, why do you guys need to do this? And, you know, the response was, like, Neil was sitting there at the table too. And basically, I think uh, our response was, you need to do this when you don't have a problem so that when you do have a problem, you have a solution. So, um, you know, I think uh, what we've recommended is where I'm ready to start the discussion. Uh, I don't think there are any hard and fast numbers here other than we did, um, agree that the mayor should vote. So we'll have at least, uh, you know, a super majority on these issues and the mayor can vote as long as the mayor is not the accused. So um, that that's it. That's all I have to add. Just some observations from this morning and talking to some other municipal uh, elected officials. So. Thanks, Mike. Ryan, did you want to add anything? Go, go yeah, ahead. And just brief, briefly. First, I want to, I want to say like three things, basically. First, uh, I wanted to thank the subcommittee members. Uh, you know, there was actually quite a few meetings and a lot of detailed discussion and some close calls. But again, these are just recommendations to the full mayor and council, but some close calls where we would expect that in the course of our discussions, there might be little tweaks as to, you know, how many meetings in a row missed is the right number of meetings uh, in a row missed without an excuse. Uh, to kick someone off the council. It, it might be what we recommended. It might be a little more, it might be a, a little less, right? Um, but um, the committee did a really great job, in particular, Lynn, um, who, you know, carried a lot of the water on, on the legal research and drafting and all that, and, and, her, and her team and her, in her office. Um, Tanisha was also on the subcommittee with us. And so the four of us, Mike, uh, Lynn, Tanisha, and I um, met several times. And so thanks to them for their work on this. I want to echo what Mike said about sort of the time being right to do this. Um, we are fortunate that we don't really have, haven't had many of these types of issues or any maybe, uh, I don't wanna say any, we may have had you know a few here and there in the past, but uh, no major issues uh, of this nature, um, at least as far as I can remember. Uh, and um, I agree that the time to implement these kinds of rules is not when you're already in the throes of some scandal or some problem uh, that's really serious with a particular member of the mayor and council. Now, hopefully, we never will have any scandals or uh, serious problems with any member of the mayor and council, but this is preventative and the time to put something in place is when all is quiet um, so that, God forbid, when the situation does come, we've already got the rules in place. The third thing I want to say is that our subcommittee really endeavored to try and and keep the balance uh, at the forefront of our minds when we were making these recommendations in terms of we want to make sure that people are held accountable, people in power are held accountable for things that the rules don't really hold them accountable for right now. And we really need to make sure that there is a sufficient process to really hold people accountable and provide appropriate penalties 
uh, for significant bad acts. At the same time, the balance requires us out of respect for the democratic process to make it not too easy to kick a duly elected person who is you know, elected by the people to be their representative in government to kick such a person out of office. So it has to be, you know, the bar has to be sufficiently high because that's a big deal. That's essentially reversing the will of the people. Um, so we kept that balance at the forefront to really try to consider, you know, how do we make it hard enough that it's not too easy, but how do we make it still doable uh, if we're in a, an unfortunate situation where it really does need to happen, which we hopefully never will be in. So I just wanted to kind of uh, put that out there. Um, and, and then the last thing I'll say is that it's possible that a couple of the recommendations here and some of the language in our charter and our code are duplicative of uh, things that are already in state law that you know I think um, has been mentioned already. Um, we may decide that even though it's duplicative, we might just want to have it in there for safekeeping. You never know when the state might change their laws as well. I mean, there's no harm in having certain things be in there um, in two places. But if we as a council decide we don't really need that, I understand. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay, Neil, I'm going to go to you in a sec, but, but I, I, I need to say a few words first. Um, so this just just backtracking a, a little bit this whole thing really did stem from a conversation between me and ryan uh i th i think it was the beginning of the year some somewhere around then and as lynn mentioned at the beginning of the presentation we had seen a news story about an issue that happened in another jurisdiction and it got us to thinking what remedies would we have if, if for malfeasance like real malfeasance among elected officials and there wasn't much. And so that's what got us this, this conversation going and got us here tonight. Um, I want to congratulate everybody, Mike, Ryan, Lynn, every, whoever else was involved in these meetings. I think the work product is really good. I think we're at a really good starting point. Um, there could be some fine tuning as we go. Like, for example, uh, what's the definition of moving out of the city? Uh, you know, how do you, how do we determine what's permanent? I mean, if, if, for example, there's a flood here and we have to go stay at a hotel that happens to be in Germantown or something for a temporary time, is that I, I just want to clarify stuff like that. Um, as far as the six meeting requirement, I think six might be a little too many, but I, I'd rather make it three or four. But do work sessions count as meetings? Um, you know, what is the definition of of meetings? OK, so things like that could be worked out during during the process we can fine tune that wordsmith it but i'm really really pleased with the with the work product i think this is a really this is a really great start it's exactly what i think um ryan and i had in mind in that first conversation and you guys really uh mike and and ryan and lynn whoever else really helped flesh this out so i want to say thanks and congratulations great job and i'm going to hand it over to neil harris all right, thanks, Mayor. And uh, I also appreciate the work that the subcommittee performed on this. And as uh, Mike said, there was some discussion uh, very relevant to this at the Maryland Municipal League Conference this morning. Uh, so a couple of things. One is that I had a conversation late in the day uh, with the mayor of Frederick, who pointed out that some of what we have here is duplicative of what's in the state constitution. Uh, section uh, 15 or Ar article 15 section 2 uh, not doesn't just talk about misdemeanors which is what's on the slide but basically says that if a an elected official is convicted of a felony while in office they're suspended from office period they're not it's not optional they're suspended from office uh, the uh, the body of, can appoint a temporary successor until all appeals are, uh, if any, are exhausted. So I think the language that we have is actually much more liberal because it says in this in the proposal that uh, until all appeals are, uh, are exhausted, uh, then no action should be, would be taken is my reading of it. Um, you know, the appeal process is not quick. Uh, I think that the conviction 
even if it's not final, should be uh, the, the point at which the change is made. That's pretty serious. Um, also, well, yeah. Neil, before you go on, can we have can we just have Lynn respond to how the state constitution would uh, that provision would apply here or interact with this? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the state constitution provision would still be applicable. So uh, again, if an if an elected official um, is found guilty of a either a felony or the misdemeanor that we, we talked about all the different types of misdemeanors. Um, they are suspended through the appeal process, um, and, you know, you would have the ability under the Maryland constitution to appoint someone on a temporary basis, um, in that particular sense so that, you know, you can still function and not have the, the issue of, you know, not having enough individuals. Um, it is only upon the finding of a, of a final conviction that they would be removed um, by operation of law. So that does mirror what we are proposing here. So I mean, I think that was the one, I mean, Ryan mentioned that, you know, we are a little bit duplicative of the state law uh, with that particular provision. You know, we did find that there were a number of jurisdictions in Maryland that do have that provision in their constitution or in their charter, which is, why we included it there, uh, but certainly ours would not supersede the the Maryland Constitution um, in any way. It's it's just I guess supplementing it in a way. Okay, thank you. I don't. I just don't understand why we wouldn't want to take the kind of more severe approach that the Constitution has of the kind of immediate suspension upon uh, conviction. But we can have that discussion. Um, also, again, as has been discussed, the six consecutive meeting, missing six consecutive meetings without an excuse seems a lot to me. Uh, uh, I guess in the case of the mayor of Seat Pleasant, uh, who missed three consecutive meetings without an excuse and was removed from office, that doesn't seem unreasonable. I would hope that if I missed three consecutive meetings without an excuse, it's because I was in a coma or some, something along those lines. Uh, that's just, that would uh, be an excuse, Neil. That would be an excuse. Well, I wouldn't be able to ask to submit an excuse, but yes. Um, at any rate, I think that is a little bit more liberal than I would uh, expect behavior from an elected official. I think, you know, it's not hard to have an, a reasonable excuse if you have to miss a meeting. And especially if we're going to go virtual or at least hybrid going forward, it's, it's easy, easy to attend a meeting and hard to do it without uh, without some reasonable or without some way to to have an excuse. Um, I'm a little bit more concerned about the process, the, the process that's envisioned uh, for the rest of it. And my question for the subcommittee is, uh, was, was the process that was laid out developed purely internally or were you looking at other jurisdictions and how they handle it? Because it just it seems a little convoluted and I, I'm very uncomfortable with, you know, uh, a complaint about some behavior uh, being a trigger for removal from office. I mean, I'm sensitive to the fact that people behave badly and should be dealt with appropriately, but there's at some point, I, my inclination, and, and you know, I could be persuaded otherwise, but my inclination would be to say that at some point, you go back to the voters and say, look, here's, here's what we've seen. Uh, what do you want us to do? Because the voters might not think that the, that the behavior is inappropriate or uh, as, you know, I just don't want the, the process to get overly, um, I want to say political, but more bureaucratic. I don't think that's really appropriate for this particular case, but I'm just curious what other jurisdictions are doing along these lines, because I haven't really heard much about how the, those processes work. Okay, I saw Lynn unmute first. We'll go to Lynn and then and then Ryan. Okay, um, uh, two points I wanted to touch on briefly. First was um, just clarification, and this goes to both uh, Neil's question as well as as Judd's initial question. The way that the amendment to section 17 is currently drafted for the six consecutive meetings 
it does provide that there are regular meetings of the mayor and council. So that would not include work sessions. So, you know, again, that's a, you know, a fairly, you know, I guess generous standard is, is the way to, to put it. Um, with regard to the process, you know, when we looked around the state, there really weren't um, other jurisdictions that had um, any process. Um, I know that Frederick has, has been um, working towards developing their own process. Um, they have chosen to refer theirs to their ethics commission um, and their ethics commission has an internal, you know, hearing process kind of similar to what we have proposed in the regulations. Um, the hearing process itself um, is very similar to the process that is used both by the city's ethics commission for complaints as well as the city's personnel review board um, that hears appeals from employees who have been uh, terminated, demoted, or suspended for more than, than three days. Uh, so we did you know, kind of look at those processes that we already had in place and um, you know, crafted those provisions and the regulations to um, look at least similar to those existing processes. Okay, we'll go to Ryan. Wait, I have, one, I have one last question, sorry. Well, Ryan wanted to answer your previous. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, Neil, good question. Um, I um, thought a lot about that. I think the subcommittee thought a lot about that. And I think it was important to us to put in, as I mentioned with the balancing issue at the beginning, a lot of safeguards uh, for due process along the way. And what that means though, of course, is that when you put in a lot of safeguards, you know, you tend to sort of um, necessarily have to create a little bit of administrative bureaucracy. For example, you know, the accused person has to have the opportunity to, you know, be heard and look at evidence and there needs to be sort of a hearing and all that kind of stuff, um, which creates layers. But um, I, I did want to say that the reason we combined the Ethics Commission and the Personnel Review Board here was precisely because we believe that the Personnel Review Board already has a lot of experience dealing with these types of issues, not with elected officials, but with staff. And so we'll already have sort of the judicial, if you will, expertise to bring to the table to sort of understand the difference between uh, a frivolous claim and a claim that you know might be legit. Um, and the ethics board had more of the experience dealing with regulating elected officials, which the uh, personnel review board does not. And there are some unique aspects of uh, addressing these issues in the context of elected officials. And so that's why we thought combining them together and then creating uh, this joint committee that would basically, you know, need, um, uh, you know, more than just three people <laughs> to, you know, a majority of three people, or, which is two people to, to agree to, you know, advance um, an allegation. So that's another safeguard. Um, and, you know, there are a variety of other safeguards sort of built into the process as well. Uh, personally, you know, I mean, I think the reason we've come this far in this process is because I don't, and I think others agree, although not everybody, maybe, um, I don't feel that we should simply wait around to the next election when there's an egregious misconduct. Um, that's to me, you know, it seems insufficient. Um, so I do think there needs to be a process, but I do think we need to make sure we build in all these safeguards so it becomes, you know, fair, as fair as possible, um, and weeds out as much as possible politically motivated or other frivolous allegations, because I agree with you that that's a real concern and we need to make sure that our process um, considers that. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say is that the idea of removal from office, I mean, there are certain things we're saying that automatically trigger removal from office, like really obvious, bad, clear cut things. And then for allegations that are brought, vetted, put forth in a, you know, in an objective hearing, ruled upon, um, our system that we're proposing does not require removal from office. That is simply the most severe consequence that, you know, that the a mayor and council can decide they want to issue, but it doesn't have to be. They could do something less than that, depending on the nature um, of, the, of the action at issue. And of course, requiring supermajorities along the way 
um, you know, is another safeguard as well. But I'm saying they, they don't necessarily have to, you know, if they do find somebody did something wrong, they don't necessarily have to kick them out of office. They could do other things uh, short of that. Um, so that's hopefully a way to kind of, again, uh, be proportionate. Go ahead, Neil. All right. The last question I have is, uh, is a little bit more of a, not, not that serious, but more of a, a curiosity. Uh, the proposed regulations require harassment and discrimination training every two years for elected officials. What if the elected official doesn't show up? I mean, is there, uh, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, but how do you force an elected official to participate in something like that? Lynn, I'll call on you for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure the answer myself. That, I mean, that would also be a violation of the policy. So, you know, the mayor and council could choose to impose, they could issue a cease and desist, or it would be kind of the opposite of a cease and desist order. It would be uh, like an injunction, know, an injunction uh, requiring the individual to, to do that and, you know, potentially, um, you know, taking them off committee assignments until they did the, until they uh, participated in the training. Doesn't the mayor have the unilateral right to appoint and uh, unappoint people to committees at this time? Um, he does have the authority to appoint with consent of the council. Um, and then, yeah, would also have the authority to remove. <clears throat> Is that it, Neil? Because yeah, Mike, Mike wants to jump in with to address some of your stuff. Mike can have a turn. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> no, I just wanted I wanted to respond. I mean, first of all, uh, to go back to your original, your first set of questions, is it is a uh, a complaint being filed? It can't be anonymous. Uh, there, you know, there's a formal process, uh, and it triggers an investigation. It's the result of the investigation by an independent outside body, or person, or firm, or whatever, that then goes to the to our joint committee. So it's not a frivolous process. It requires some investigation and they're, you know, the outcome of that investigation is what's reviewed. Uh, and there, I think there's, there's due process there. Um, I think the other thing we have to remember with regard to your last question that we do have to remember that the oath of office includes uh, uh, that, that we are obedient to the, the charter and code of the city of Gaithersburg and other, uh, I don't remember the exact wording. I guess I need the U.S. Uh, and the Maryland Constitution. U.S. and Maryland Constitution. So you know, we we uh, th that's the oath that we take. So if one violates that oath, then you know, number one, they can't say they're unaware of it because they took the oath. And number two, if they violate the oath, and that may include something to do with training or whatever other requirements there are for office, then then that that's what we do. But I I would assume that if somebody refused to take the training, then we, we could consider uh, other action. And then I wanna go back to one of Judd's question is how do we determine residency? And I think it has to do with the primary domicile of the, of the council member or the mayor. And if the primary domicile, it, you know, so maybe they're a snowbird, okay? So if they, they end up moving to Florida, uh, having a residence in Florida and they're spending more time in Florida than they are in Gaithersburg and perhaps even voting in Florida, then they're no longer a resident of the city. It's not their primary domicile. So I don't think that definition is that hard to deal with. So, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mike. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to say on the domicile thing, we had a discussion about that in the subcommittee and Lynn and I talked about it. That is a legal term of art, domicile. And there is plenty of case law out there that sort of defines what that means in different situations where mayor, if you have to live in a hotel because you had a house fire, you know, all kinds of situations that have been litigated over the years. The term domicile is, you know, there's, it's pretty well defined. Um, yeah, maybe fact specific in terms of what was your intent and all of that, but it's not something that I don't think we, I don't think we have to define it because I think it's been already addressed so many times by courts. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask was what's, what happens, we, there are other obligations that we already have on the books as, as, mayor and council members that we are required to do. 
So what happens if we don't do those? I mean, if we're talking about comparing that to a situation where a sitting council member doesn't go to a mandatory training, like we have to file annual financial disclosures. What happens if a council member just simply says, I'm not going to do it? Um, does our current law say that they get kicked off the council or does it say nothing? Yeah, for, the, for that particular one, um, for example, if you wouldn't file your ethics disclosure statements, there are penalties within the ethics ordinance right. uh, that could be subject to a cease and desist order, which right. is approval by circuit court, and then there's right. um, fines that can be imposed. Yeah, so that's my point, which is that we already kind of have examples of these sorts of things that exist. And so if we can do it for that, then we can sort of do the same thing uh, to enforce trainings that we want to add. Thanks, Ryan. Rabu, you've been quiet. Do you want to add anything here? Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I was, I was waiting my turn. And mine's more a question of timing. Um, assuming there's a, a positive recommendation today, what would be the timing for an ultimate introduction vote and whatnot? Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um... You know, certainly both the, the charter and the code requirements do require, you know, our standard introduction, public hearing, um, final policy discussion. The regulations do require also introduction. It's optional whether the mayor and council hold a public hearing, but then there would be policy discussion. We would certainly try to run those all on the, on the, the same track. Um, you know, we could potentially introduce these probably first meeting in December timeframe. I mean, I'd have to look at the agenda and, and what we already have scheduled, but um, again, the thought process is, you know, probably, you know, December, January introduction. Um, the charter provision does have a 45 day referendum period. So it does not go into effect for 45 days um, after the vote. So again, you're, you're probably looking, you know, probably six months out for these to be effective. Okay. Yeah. I, my, my thought is with, with an election coming up and two new council members coming on that they have the opportunity to think and deliberate on the introduction and whether they would support the introduction as is, or whether they'd require or ask for modifications prior to introduction. Um, so that would just be my one concern. Okay. Um, well, let me open it up to any members of the public who'd like to speak on this topic. It, if, if there's anybody there who'd like to speak, please just use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you. Going once, going twice. I do not see any hands going up. Okay. Um, Tanisha, please go ahead. I just want to take a quick opportunity to, to thank the subcommittee for their diligence. Um, we really stretched Mike and Ryan a lot uh, during our meetings uh, on topics that weren't comfortable. And I thought they did a great job of balancing it. And of course, um, Lynn did an absolutely incredible job of not just pulling the process together, but as you may have heard, it, these provisions didn't exist for us and in a model um, didn't really exist. And so uh, we really needed the subcommittee's input to, to figure out how to proceed. Uh, but Lynn did an incredible amount of research and background and trying to figure out who's already done this. And I think like many things we do in Gaithersburg, we're going to be a model um, on this. It doesn't mean it's perfect out the gate. And, and I would imagine over time, uh, we'll have some opportunities to tweak things, which is why we separated um, putting some things into the regulations, which are more easily adjusted if, if we're finding they're not working or we find some other uh, examples across the state or across the country that help to inform our policy. But just want to really acknowledge Lynn's effort on this. It, it was um, not an easy task, and I thought she did an amazing job. And thanks to the subcommittee for providing all the substance for us to really craft something or for Lynn to craft something to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha, for making that excellent point. Um, we are used to uh, and, and hopefully don't take Lynn for granted because she's amazing in all the stuff she does. Um, and this is 
100% not the first time we've asked her to sort of create new ground uh, for us. Um, I, I'm thinking 5G actually, as, as I, as I'm, uh, it just comes to mind quickly. Um, so Lynn, if we were to sort of give head nods tonight, it would still require um, somebody, it would still require us to sponsor an introduction. There would have to be a vote of the new council in order to introduce this. We're not, we wouldn't be voting to introduce at a work session. So just to, to, to get to Rob's point, the, uh, the new council members would have a chance to vote yay or nay on whether to introduce, correct? Uh, that is correct. And certainly if there were amendments, you know, at that time they could be made before the public hearing. Okay. Uh, Mike, I saw your hand up. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I guess the uh, the only issue I think kind of that, that we might want to consider right now is whether the six meeting, six consecutive regular meeting requirement is is a bar too high. And maybe, um, you know, as I pointed out, we have two regular meetings of the mayor and council every month. So six consecutive meetings would be missing three months of meetings, uh, just regular mayor and council meetings. So maybe that's a bit much, uh, you know, it would certainly be easy to break that streak just by saying, oh, I've missed five in a row. I think I'll come to a meeting next week. Uh, and then after that meeting, they could do another five. So it doesn't really correct the kind of behavior that you want to correct. So I'm, I'm certainly willing to, to think about some, some revisions there before we go further. And then to the issue of, look, clearly I'm not going to be around to vote on this. Uh, I think I don't have any problem with new council members having to deal with weighty subjects. And if they're dealing with a weighty subject or topic in the first month of their term, this, there's no better time for them to do it because they're paying close attention to everything that's happening. And certainly I think uh, it gives them the opportunity to, to consider the impact of the decisions that they're gonna make as council members. So that's the process we have. I don't think you delay it because it's a weighty topic and you have new people. I think you just move on. So anyway, I just wanted to raise that issue of maybe six is too many. We could think about that now, or we could just wait. You could just wait until it's introduced and you have the, the hearing on it, so. Well, just as a matter of speaking to that point, I, you know, I brought it up earlier. I think six is, I, it's too low of a bar. I think, I think, uh, you know, can you imagine a situation in which the mayor, whether it's me or somebody else later, just doesn't show up unexcused to even like two meetings in a row? But I mean, if we were going to say three, like like what happened in Seat Pleasant, um, it's just unthinkable to me. That's somebody who's really not doing their duty. If they if if they're if, unexcused, they're not even making an effort to make an excuse. They're just not showing up for meetings three meetings in a row, not even counting work sessions. To me, that, you know, three is a good level. Um, I don't know where everybody else is. Anybody want to speak to this or should we wait till the introduction? Rob Wu, go ahead. I mean, if we're going to raise the topic, then, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's concerning as well as it looks like the excusal mechanism, meaning I could get to, uh, excuse number five, and then just email the clerk and saying, I'm not gonna be there. And it's an automatic excuse and it resets the clock. Like you don't have to show up to that last, the next, the meeting to reset the clock in Mike's example under how I'm reading this. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's that's one way of, of looking at it. I think that, so, you know, we look, we just put the marker on the table. I think it's- Yeah, it, this is not- it. You know, so, by, by broaching this topic, it's not a criticism of, of the work no, no. product. At I, I all. think we, yeah, I think we realize that. And, and I think we realize it even more this morning as we were having this discussion around the breakfast table with, with people from other municipal municipalities about how they handle it, uh, what they, you know, what their standard is. So I think it's, it's certainly appropriate to consider that now or just wait, you know, uh, but like I said, it's three months, three months of, me of, of meetings. Right. That's a quarter of the year. Yeah. So, uh, okay, I see Neil's hand up. Go ahead, Neil. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I raised this earlier in my uh, in my comment. I thought six was a really la large number and beyond unacceptable. I think three, like C. Pleasant used, is probably. I mean, I think missing three uh, actual meetings, missing six weeks of, of of council meetings and votes without an excuse is unexcusable. Tanisha, go right ahead. So I just want to um, summarize some of the discussion that we had in the subcommittee and why this is a, a really challenging, I think, thing to pin down, something to think about, whether it's for tonight or, or in the future. You know, there's the concept of we looked at a 12 month uh, period of time. Right? So condensing the time frame, we looked at should it be excused or unexcused? So just an absence in general. And if you head in that direction and, and you put a time frame around it, right, you can kind of go with a larger number of meetings. Um, I think that I think we're why we landed near six. And Ryan, Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Was we were thinking about that balance that Ryan mentioned, um, that that this is the automatic removal. Right. So it's not it's not that. You got to three, if we reduce it to three unexcused, then there's discussion among the mayor and council about a potential sanction or a censure or something along those lines. Um, this, this was sort of the you know, automatic removal and thinking about how does that impact the democratic process and the duly elected official. So it, it is it was it's challenging to come up with a number. And I think, you know, we it, I think we'll all be open to hear if there's some interest in having that be rolling, condensing the time frame in a certain amount of time. If we if we look at a certain amount of time, do we want to then air toward um, it's an absence, uh, whether it's excused or not excused? Of course, there are the medical and other, you know, extraneous uh, exceptions. So we wouldn't have to worry about those kinds of things. but. That's kind of where we went. <laughs> if I if I missed any of them, Mike or Ryan or Lynn, let me know. But it, it was this was a this was a challenging one when you think about it falling into the automatic category where you'd be removed from office. Lynn, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, just just by the the way of background, and we provided more of this with the the last work session. When we looked at other charters around um, the state, there were a number of municipalities that did have a provision dealing with, you know, the number of meetings that you missed. Um, generally, they were either three, four, six, or nine meetings, um, but they differed in whether they were consecutive or if they were within a one-year period. So I think, you know, certainly when you go to the the, the larger number, the nine number. Um, you know, in those municipalities, it was meetings within a one year period, not consecutive. All right. Well, I don't think we're going to get a resolution tonight, nor do we need to. Um, but it's it's sort of the discussions on the table as uh, Lynn, as you and staff draft something to be introduced at some point, then um, you know, I guess the new council can weigh in. It's probably it, this is probably a situation where we want the new council to, to weigh in as well. Um, so, do you feel guided? Okay. Yes. The answer to that is yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Perfect. Well, then, uh, unless anybody has anything else else to add, then I will note that we have a regular meeting next week, uh, Monday night. October 18th, 7.30 p.m. Uh, and until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned.